Well, today, as we continue our series in Romans, we're looking at the end of chapter 3 and all of chapter 4. And we're going to be focusing on two essential truths. The first truth is salvation is not the result of any human effort. So we can't boast or take credit for it. The second truth is we can have full assurance what God promises he does perform. You know, as I studied this passage, both of those truths resonated with me because they describe the first 18 years of my life. As I was growing up, I was part of what I could call a religious family. And we went to church every Sunday. In fact, there was a period I went to church every Sunday straight for three years. Now, I need to confess something. The reason why I went to church was because they gave trophies and medals for perfect attendance. Maybe some of you remember those medals. And if you continued in perfect attendance, they would add a bar. I thought that was cool. So that's why I went to church. It wasn't about so much the spiritual. It was more the materialistic that I wanted. So through middle school, through high school, I could describe myself as a person that I knew a lot about God. I had a lot of information about God. But I did not know God. I did not have a personal relationship with him. You know, and I remember, especially in middle school, there were several nights when I went to bed, I cried myself to sleep. Because I wasn't sure what would happen if I would die. I thought I was a good person, and I went to church, but I didn't have that assurance that God would accept me if I were to die. Then when I was 18, I went off to college. And while I was at college, I met a man named John, another student. And I was told by the other students that you're better off if you stay away from John. Because he's one of those religious guys. So just avoid him. Well, that intrigued me. So I spent time with John. I got to know him. We became friends. And one night, John said, Robin, why don't you come up to my room? I'd like to talk to you. And I knew John wanted to talk about religion. But I also wanted to hear what John had to say. So I went up to his room. And when I got there, he had a Bible. And he said, Robin, I'm a Christian. And Jesus Christ has changed my life. And then he shared from the Bible. He would open it up. We'd look at verses. How I could have a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's like the light went on. All that information that was up here started going down here. And I realized that's what I need. That's what I want. So right there in that dorm room, I prayed. And I asked Jesus to come into my life to forgive me and take control of my life. You know, when I did that, I didn't see any angels, and I didn't hear any bells ringing, but I knew what I had just done in my heart was right. And I will be eternally grateful, because now the peace that I was looking for was in my heart. You know, if we trust in just 1% of our own human effort or our own goodness, we can never rest secure and have peace with God. That's because our salvation is not about what we can do. It's about what Christ has done for us. 
And it's only when we trust in him and what he's done that we can have peace and forgiveness. You know, we've seen in the first three chapters of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul is acting like a prosecuting attorney. And he brings all of humanity before God, the supreme judge of the universe, and declares them guilty of sin. So the bad news is we are guilty. But we need to understand the bad news before we can fully embrace and appreciate the good news. So halfway into chapter 3, Paul begins to share the good news of God's righteousness and how now it's been revealed and he forgives people who are under the grip of sin. At the end of the chapter, Paul wants everyone to know when it comes to salvation, there's no room for boasting. And he challenges anyone who thinks they can take credit in pleasing God. In verse 27, this is what he says. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No. Because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law or human effort. It's based on faith. So, and here's the good news, we are made right with God through faith and not obeying the law. Now, last week we learned that Paul uses several different theological terms to describe our salvation. And all of them are important. Words like grace, justification, redemption, propitiation. And there's one in particular I like to highlight, and it's justification by faith. It's important we understand what that means. So let's start with a definition. Justification by faith is the act of God, whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Christ on the basis of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Justification is a one-time act. It's not a process. And every believer has the same standing before God. You may have heard the term that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That's true. That means all of us that have been justified by faith have the same standing before God. Justification is something only God does. And that means no human being can boast about it. No human being can say, I justified myself. Justification doesn't mean God makes us righteous. What it does mean is God declares us righteous. And he puts the righteousness of Christ on our record in place of our sin. So it's God who does all the work when it comes to salvation, so we can't boast. We can't take any credit for it. Let's say that you're swimming in a swimming pool, and you're swimming along, and all of a sudden you cramp up big time. And you start to sink, and you're going under the water. In fact, you're drowning. Fortunately, the lifeguard sees you, and he jumps in, and he saves you, and he pulls you out of the water off to the side of the pool. Then after a few minutes, can you imagine, once you catch your breath, that you start boasting to everybody around and say, Hey, did you see me? Did you see how I saved myself? That's ridiculous. That's also not true. 
You didn't save yourself. It was the lifeguard that saved you. If it wasn't for the lifeguard, you'd be at the bottom of the pool. Well, it's the same way we're saved by faith. So the only thing that we should be boasting is in is the person who saved us. That's what Paul meant when he wrote to the Galatians. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has died. Boasting in what we've done is excluded because salvation is not about what we can do. It's about what Christ has done for us. I have a picture that hopefully will help you understand this concept. It's a turtle on a fence post. Now, if you have ever seen a turtle on a fence post, you know it had help getting there. It is impossible for a turtle on its own effort to climb up a fence post and sit on the top. So what had to happen was someone had to reach down, pick up the turtle, and place it on the fence post. The same is true with us when it comes to salvation. God had to reach down with his victorious right hand and pick us up. Now, can you imagine a turtle boasting how he got to the top of the fence post all in his own effort? That's just as ridiculous as us boasting. It's only through God reaching down and picking us up that we're saved. In his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul expressed the same truth. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. See, if we could obtain salvation through our own efforts, do you know what we would do? Hey, look at me. We would strut our stuff and say it's because of me and my efforts and my goodness that I got saved. And Paul says, no. It's by grace that you're saved, not through works. You know, and that's what I was doing with my medals and my perfect attendance and my trophies. I was proud of that. And I was hoping that God would accept me because of it. But I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if he would. This week I was meeting with a friend and we were talking about salvation. And during our discussion, he said, you know what? We bring nothing to the table of salvation except our grateful heart. And I like that. That's true. I also like what Jesus said to the people that were following him who thought the way to God was by being good or through doing good works. And the Gospel of John records Jesus saying, they, meaning the people following Jesus, replied, we want to perform good God's works too. What should we do? Now that's a valid question. They want to perform God's works. What should we do? Look at what Jesus said. This is the only work God requires from you. Believe in the one 
he has sent. All that God requires, the only work he has for us to do, is to believe in the one he has sent. That's it. Paul continues by saying, you know, God doesn't have two ways of salvation. He doesn't have a way of salvation for the Jews. He doesn't have a way of salvation for the Gentiles. He said, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. See, the Jews had been given the law, which is God's standard of righteousness. And they thought if they obeyed the law, God would accept them. And now, Paul is saying Gentiles can also be made right with God apart from obeying the law. Now, this concept of Jews and Gentiles being declared righteous by God, it was a hard one for the Jews to grasp. And Paul's Jewish audience would immediately begin to wonder about things like circumcision, because they were circumcised and the Gentiles were not. They would also wonder about Abraham, their forefather, because they believed of all people, Abraham was the most obedient person who ever lived. If anyone, the Jews thought, had a reason to boast, Abraham would. So, Paul responds by devoting all of chapter 4 to how Abraham was justified by faith faith apart from works. And if you're not familiar with the story of Abraham, it's a fascinating story found in the book of Genesis where God made some breathtaking promises to Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, when we're first introduced to him, his name is Abram. Go. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, Abraham, all families of the earth shall be blessed. It's awesome. God promises Abram that he will make him into a great nation. And he will bless him and make his name great. And later, God changes his name to Abraham, which means Father of many. And here we are today, almost 4,000 years later, and Abraham's name is one of the most globally recognized names in all of history. You know, that really does have God's fingerprints all over it. Because Abraham was never a king. Abraham was never a famous general. In fact, Abraham didn't do any of the things that usually make people famous. And yet God promised he would make his name famous. So even though God promised he would make Abraham's descendants into a great nation, there was a problem. Abraham and his wife Sarah were childless. And when the promise was given, they were well beyond their childbearing years. So because of that, Abraham assumes that a servant of his household 
named Elizer would be his heir. But God disagreed. And this is what he said. No, no, your servant will not be your heir. For you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars, if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Just imagine what that would have been like, going out on a dark Mideastern night. No pollution. Thousands, thousands, thousands of stars. And God says, Abram, that's how many descendants you will have. So, if Abraham's human effort and good works made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. He would have. But Paul says it doesn't work that way. And he refers back to Scripture. For what does the Scripture say? You know what? That's always a good question to ask. What does the Bible say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Did you notice the word counted in those verses? It's a key word that's used 11 times in chapter 4. And it's a banking term that means to put into one's account. You know, when I graduated from college, I got a job as a bank teller. And when people would come in to make a deposit... I would credit that to their account. The same way when someone is justified by faith, God credits his righteousness into their account. So, Abraham didn't work for his salvation. He simply trusted what God had promised. You know, Paul also goes on to use one of the kings of Israel, David, as an example of someone who was declared righteous without working for it. And he quotes from one of David's psalms after he wrote this psalm after his sin with Bathsheba. And David writes, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Did you know if you're a Christian here this morning, when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his son? That's why you can come into the presence of a holy God. It's not because of your righteousness, because Isaiah says... Your righteousness before God is like filthy rags. But when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of his son Jesus. And he welcomes you into his presence. If you're not a Christian, when God sees you, he sees your sinfulness. He loves you, but there's a separation because of your sin between him and God. And Scripture says the only way that separation can be bridged is by believing in what Christ has done for you and receiving him into your life. And then the Bible says you become a child of God. That is good news. Paul 
Paul goes on. In the next section of chapter 4, this is what he says. Abraham was declared righteous before he was circumcised. So after Paul talks about the joy which comes from being declared righteous, he asks a really good question because he knows his Jewish audience is going to be thinking this. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised, the Jews, or also for the uncircumcised, the Gentiles? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. See, this is a very important point. Because the Jews believed for someone to be righteous before God, they must be circumcised and they must obey the law. The story of Abraham shows us he was circumcised when he was 99 years old. And that was 14 years after God had counted him righteous because of his faith. So if God declared Abraham righteous 14 years before he was circumcised, then circumcision had nothing to do with Abraham being declared righteous. He was declared righteous because he believed what God said he would do. The same is true today. Because we're declared righteous, not because of what we do, but because we trust in what Christ has done for us on the cross. Circumcision in Abraham's day played much the same role as believers' baptism does today. They're both an external sign, but neither one can save anybody. So, Paul concludes chapter 4 by declaring, Abraham was justified by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Remember, his Jewish audience will be thinking, what about Abraham? What about Abraham? How was he declared righteous? So that's why Paul devotes this whole chapter to answering those questions. And he makes it clear, from a reproductive point of view, Abraham and his wife Sarah were dead. It was unthinkable. A man, 99 years old, could father a child in the womb of his wife, who is 89 years old. And yet, Abraham believed God could bring life from Sarah's dead womb. And Paul saw the rejuvenation of Abraham's body as a picture of resurrection brought about by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You know, in the midst of all this, it's really important to note that Abraham's faith did not cause him to close his eyes to reality. He was fully aware when it came to having children, he and his wife Sarah were way past their childbearing years. But he believed what God promises he performs. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is from the book of Numbers. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? That's a great reminder because God doesn't lie. He doesn't. And God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because of that, he and his words are worthy to be trusted in. And you may be here today and you're facing what looks like an impossible situation. It could be related to your finances. 
It could be related to a relationship. It could be related to something at work. It could be related to your health. Whatever it is, it looks impossible. I hope the story of Abraham will be an encouragement to you because it's a powerful example of a man who trusted God and persevered regardless of his circumstances. I have a picture I'd like to show you. This is a picture of my 90-year-old mother jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. Something she wanted to do a couple of months ago, she did it. It's an example of someone not allowing circumstances. She's also legally blind. So she's 90 years old and legally blind. She didn't allow those circumstances to prevent her. She still needed to place her faith in the man with her that he knew what he was doing, that the parachute would all open. But don't allow circumstances to dictate behavior. Trust in the God that's greater than the circumstances. Trust in the God who said, walk by faith, not by sight. You know, the story of Abraham, it's a great reminder that even when we do believe, we do believe what God says, there's no assurance that the promise will immediately be fulfilled. Did you know when God told Abraham he would have a son, he was 75 years old. And he still waited 25 years for his son Isaac to be born. That's a quarter of a century he waited. And he waited. And he waited. And I know some of you here are waiting for God to answer what you've been praying. Maybe for a long time. Let me encourage you. Persevere. Persevere. Remember Abraham. He said he continued to give God the glory because he trusted in him. Don't allow your circumstances to dictate your behavior. Trust in God. I think one of the reasons God delayed in fulfilling his promise was to allow all of Abraham and Sarah's power and natural strength to decline and then disappear. It was gone. The same thing is true for us. God must also wait until we realize we're unable to save ourselves. Then when we realize, God can unleash his saving power into our lives. See, as long as we think we're good enough, or we're smart enough, or we're strong enough to save ourselves, we will never be able to save by grace, God's grace. It's only when we admit, I'm powerless. Apart from you, I can't do this. I need you. Abraham's example of being justified by faith is exactly what the gospel offers to all people today. So that's why Paul concludes chapter 4 by saying, and when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was, it was recorded for our benefit too. That's good news. Assuring us that God will also count us righteous if we believe in him. That's good news. Who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. So Paul presents Christ's resurrection as proof that God accepted his son's sacrifice and all sinners, including us, can be declared righteous. And even though Abraham's story happened a long time ago, 
It's still relevant today. Why? Because it reveals what God requires. And what he requires isn't human effort or even being a good person. It requires we admit we need him and ask him to take control of our life. And I really do love the story of Abraham because it's only when he recognized he was powerless that God's power went to work in his body. And I can relate with that. The same thing was true for me. It wasn't until I was 18 years old that I stopped trusting in what I can do and I started trusting in what Christ has done for me. That's when my sins were forgiven. And for the first time, I experienced peace with God. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. And if you're here this morning, and you're trusting in just 1% of your own human effort, or your own goodness, or your trophies, or your medals, whatever it is you're trusting in, you will never be able to experience peace with God. So I encourage you to admit to God you're powerless and ask Him to do what only He can do. Forgive your sins and declare you righteous. And if you do that, you will experience a peace and a joy that you never thought possible. Later in Romans, Paul writes, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, this passage is a wonderful reminder how much you love us with a deep and a durable and an abiding love. And because of that love, we are safe and secure in your arms. And we're also reminded that you are a promise-keeping God. And you are worthy to be trusted in because what you promise, you perform. I ask that you will work in the heart of anyone here who is trying to earn their way to heaven or trusting in their own efforts to please you. Would you help them realize it's by grace we're saved through faith and it's not a result of our works? And Lord, would you help all of us to follow the words of the Apostle Paul if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus who was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead so we could be forgiven. Amen. Thank you, praise team. I love the lyrics. To that song. You know why? They remind me I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Christ has taken my sin and he has given me his righteousness. Hallelujah. That's good news. And you might be here this morning and you're thinking, gosh, maybe I'm trusting in my own effort. Maybe I'm thinking because of my goodness or something that I can do I can please God. It's not about what you can do. It's about what Christ has done.
for you. Accept that. Ask him to take control of your life. You will experience a peace and a joy you did not think possible. Well, looks like it's still snowing outside, so why don't you hang around here for a little while? Get a cup of coffee, find somebody you don't know, just hang out here. But when you do leave, drive safely, and may the Lord bless you. May you understand with all of your heart, He loves you, and what He promises, He performs. Trust Him, always. You're dismissed.